But right now, we have Ron Wyatt. Ron, Hi, welcome to Maranatha. Thanks. Glad you're here. Yes. Now, you've been on, I say, Good Morning America, and what are some of the other programs? Uh, CBS Morning News. Morning News. I mean, a lot of people wanted to hear what happened to you. You and your sons were uh, doing work in Saudi Arabia, right? Yes, right. And tell us a little bit about what happened. Well, <clears throat> we, uh, to investigate a mountain that our research indicated was the real Mount uh, Sinai, mm -hmm. where the law was given, the Ten Commandments. And uh, we were proceeding to do this in what we felt was an orderly manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, we apparently got close to some missiles that were either being transported through the area or set up in the area. Mm -hmm. At least this is what the State Department said. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got ready to exit the country uh, uh, at customs, they arrested us. Okay, they arrested. Now, who arrested you? Uh, the Coast Guard is in charge of customs and they were the ones that arrested us. Okay, now when they arrested you, where did they take you? They uh, took us down to their Coast Guard headquarters, mm -hmm. and uh, we met some people there that were quite friendly at first, but we found that uh, <clears throat> they weren't all this friendly. Uh, we went through some uh, three different uh, periods of uh, interrogation and uh, the first was by this Coast Guard group. They had a general there that was commanding this, mm -hmm. and he uh, interviewed us or interrogated us through an interpreter. And I've never yet been quite convinced that the ter interpreter told him <laughs> what he was saying. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, after that, then we were uh, interrogated by the general investigating office. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in charge of that area. Uh, they, I think their office is in Tobuk. And then after that, uh, they sent some people out from the ministry. This is the kings uh, from Riyadh, mm -hmm. you know, the seat of the government, and uh, had a few questions for us too. And during this time, of course, they kept us separated so we couldn't get our stories together or whatever. Right, but, now, how long were you held? Uh, 78 days total. And um, what did it feel like? I mean, did you feel like you were going to be in there forever? Well, uh, there were times when it looked that way, right. Uh, in my archaeological research, I always pray about whether I should go, you know, on a trip mm -hmm. and if I will be successful mm -hmm. before I go. And uh, I asked for a little sign, you know. This is the only way I have of communicating with God. He doesn't speak to me, you know, like he did to Abraham, some of those folks. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I was assured that, you know, we would find uh, the mountain and that we would get back safely, my sons and I. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I wasn't being harassed too severely, I could, you know, uh, be at peace with this in mind. Mm -hmm. But there were a few times uh, you know, when this didn't seem too likely that we would get out. Now, who got you out? How, how did you get out? Well, they didn't tell us a whole lot. We were held incommunicado. They declined uh, allowing us to uh, talk with a representative of our government, which uh, international law requires that uh, they do. And so we were pretty much in the dark. They would, uh, after the preliminary or the main interrogation, periodically they would take one or the other of us up to this uh, head honcho's office and ask mm -hmm. us a few more questions. And I think they were getting these questions from their archaeology department. They were mm -hmm. seeing if we really were archaeologists <coughs> or if we were Israeli spies, which is what they accused us of being. Mm -hmm. You were getting ready to leave the country when they stopped you, right? Were you like going, get ready to get on your plane? Uh, going well, customs we had come into Jordan and into Amman and then flown down to Aqaba, and this is uh, about 10 miles from the Saudi Arabian border. Mm. Uh, so we went through at that point, and we were exiting at that point until this event. Uh-huh, <coughs> I see. Anyway, back to the other question, I'm not sure 
who got us out. Uh, some people talked to Congressman Boner's office, and I understand mm -hmm. that he put some pressure on. I met him down to the airport the other day and thanked him in person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, there was some congressmen and senators from Kentucky. I have some relatives there. And uh, some friends, uh, uh, James Irwin, one of uh, the astronauts, mm -hmm. uh, we had discussed archaeology quite a bit and were planning to do some things together. He was aware that we were over there and unofficially he had some people in some other governments put a little pressure on and so something worked. One yeah. day they came to us and said you're going home today. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I see. Mm. That was some ordeal, I tell you. Yeah. Well, what'd you find over there? Well, in Numbers 24-4, uh, for the people in the audience that are Bible uh, scholars, it says that Moses rose up early in the morning and set up 12 pillars of stone and erected an altar. Mm -hmm. All right, we felt that this would still be there because uh, people in that part of the country, uh, the Bedouins and a lot of these people, their agreements, instead of being on paper, they set up these little uh, things of stone, mm -hmm. which apparently they have some means of interpreting what these little stacks of stones mean. And uh, so all these things are uh, left alone. They're not necessarily sacred, but they are just yeah. things that, you yeah. know, people do not bother. We felt that there was a high likelihood that those stones would still be there. And so we found those. And they appeared to be intact. There had been some sand blown in over uh, up part way on the north end of the altar and some of the stones on that end. And one of the stones had been tipped over against another, but there's uh, 12 stones sitting there in a half circle in the altar right in the mouth of it. Mm. And this is facing east because God was quite particular that his mm -hmm. people did not worship the rising sun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that their backs were to that. And uh, that was quite a thrill to see that. Mm -hmm. mm. And how long have you been doing archaeology? Well, I've been an armchair archaeologist like <laughs> a lot of people for uh, more years than I'll mention. But we started making field trips in 1976. And so we have averaged probably two to three uh, trips uh, a year since that time. Oh, I see. And as far as the funding and things like this, do you just finance yourself or is there a group maybe that uh, donations or anything like that? Well, we pretty well finance ourselves. I'm a nurse anesthetist and we make a fairly good uh, salary. A what, you're a what? A nurse anesthetist. I put people to sleep for surgery. I see. Okay. Right. And uh, so I just saved my own money uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. There have been some people that have helped and uh, we, you know, appreciate that. And uh, so basically what we do, we work and when we get some money ahead, then we go on a trip. And it's always quite a thrill to me. Uh, I, I freelance. Primarily I work at uh, Nashville Memorial Hospital out in Madison right. on the west. But uh, I do freelance, some at Baptist Hospital and other hospitals. And so people start calling me and I start getting all kinds of work. Uh, uh, something tells me that it's about time for another trip. Mm -hmm. oh, That's the way it you always know. works out, yeah. Mm -hmm. When Ron was there, the local Bedouin told him that these round marble columns in the holy area uh, at the foot of the mountain had been used in a uh, monument that had been there and had been removed, the pieces had been removed in the 30s, like 1938 or something. This is what he was told. And they said um, it had been a round structure like this with columns all the way around it and with a round top like this. That's what they described to him. And that's really all he knows about this, except um, I think they said it was built by Solomon the Great, only they said Solomon the Great, which led Ron to believe that the story probably had a lot of credibility because the column, he was sure, certain that he had found, that they had seen on the beach, that that column had the name of Solomon on it and that this one had the name of Solomon 
Every time that Ron and I would go to uh, Nueva, he would want me to look across there with the telephoto lens and try to see if I could see the column over there. Yeah. Okay, because this is right at that one wadi. That big one. Okay. It's by the one that you can come to before the, before the column is and the other thing up to the north. Okay, then the other was probably the fortress and this is the column because it's all by itself. Okay. And that's all that I've never seen it in this distance. All right, let me back off and see where this is. Okay, that's right ahead by that big wadi. Okay. On the left side of it, looking there, that way. No, it's here. Ron, it's here, and then the it's here, and then the wadi goes up like that. On the right bank of it. Uh -huh. okay. Well, the left from that side. It would be on the left yeah. from that side, yeah. Okay. It was only after the Caldwells went there and went to that beach and found that there was nothing there except a piece of rebar in concrete at the exact location that we realized the column had been removed. Now, we've heard several stories now that we have people who have been traveling fairly freely through there. We have heard stories that the locals know about the column. One story, the first one that we heard, was that the column was transported to Hegel. One is that they took the column out into the water and dropped it somewhere. That would be rather difficult too because again, it is very heavy and very big. But that is the story of the column. Ron saw on the face of this mountain, uh, just up above the holy precinct, he did see that there was a huge cave up there. And he thought that had to be Elijah's cave, but he never did climb up there. Um, during his time there, he never really climbed the mountain at all. He just spent his time in the open area. But he did believe that that was most likely uh, the cave that Elijah went into. At the foot of Mount Sinai, in this area called by us, the Holy Precinct. I don't know what other people want to call it, but the area at the foot of the mountain that was holy, there is an altar. And when Ron first saw it, he was able to examine it carefully. And it had, coming out from it, what looked like a corral. It was three walls, one in the middle, you know, two on either side that looked like people or animals lined up through it, maybe 60 foot long. Up here at the other end, he said it was filled in with dirt. I think there might have been some areas that uh, had caved in or something, but it fit the biblical account of where God told them to build an altar of earth. And said, and if you will, you know, um, build it of stone, it has to be unhewn stone because if you put your tool on it, you've desecrated it. So. When Ron saw this, what he believed was the situation was that they outlined it in stone and filled it in earth. Years later, when the Saudis came, and I think this was, I'm, I'm not sure when they did this, because in Vivica's pictures, which were in maybe 97, um, the altar is still contains the earth but there were some things that looked like they had been excavated. So I don't really know when this happened, but the Saudis removed all the earth from it and made it look like one big old corral. So everybody's got all these different ideas about what the altar looked like and how it, um, how it worked and all of these different things. But I think that, um, 
I will tell you about a dream that Ron told me he had. He told me that God gave him a dream. And in this dream, he was in a vantage point up high, looking down on the altar. And he saw somebody administering the offerings at that altar. And he said, I didn't know if it was Moses or Aaron, but he described them as being bald headed right here, you know, and um, that the altar, they were working on the long altar. So I know that Ron believed it was an altar of earth containing unhewn stone. Well, the first time that Ron went and met with the Caldwells, they videoed their, their inner change with each other. And in that video, uh, Ron told them where Rephidim was. Anyway, if you can come in to Rephidim, which is uh, almost directly west, uh, you were in the area to the north and to the south and over to the east where the uh, cows and stuff like that, and those dwellings were scattered around in that area. But right over the back of the mountain, down below is Rafferton. And uh, I don't know whether they, you know, have uh, posted people to watch from that side or not. He said it's on the other side of the mountain. And what was, this is another miracle because when they, when the Caldwells went there and came into the area that Ron believed was Rephidim, they found this monstrous split rock that showed evidence of a tremendous amount of water coming out. It's absolutely spectacular. And um, I think that right there is a strong confirmation that that is Rephidim. That, uh, you know, because Ron's reasoning was, and of course God helped him with his thoughts. Ron didn't figure this out. I'm sure that God told him you know, when they call it the, the rock of Horeb in the Bible, it, it's the same mountain. And it just made sense that it would be on the other side of the mountain. And because that mountain continues like this, the only place that it could be at um, on the other side of this particular mountain would be on the other side. It couldn't be over here because this mountain continues so far. It couldn't be up here because this mountain continues so far. So I believe that that is one location in the Exodus story that is aside from the mountain being Mount Sinai, that that is, uh, there could be really no stronger confirmation than that. Ron knew that probably a big concern of the Saudis would be um, the idea of Israel trying to lay any claim to the land because Mount Sinai was in their land. He wrote a number of letters to the Saudi government through the years, and in each of those he tried to address this issue and assure them that there was no evidence, biblically or otherwise, that showed that Israel had any claim to the land. My research also proves that no one except your royal majesties have divine claim to this holy mountain. This is proven by the Torah, the Quran, and secular history. In the Torah, this is proven in the book of Deuteronomy. When Allah tells the prophet Musa to leave Jabal Musa, and lead the people north to the land he has given them, meaning the promised land. Allah says they are not to disturb the land they will pass through because this land is not theirs. Deuteronomy 2, 4 says, And command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breadth. Yes, God protected Ron and he gave him, sometimes he gave him what he needed right before he needed it. And an example of this 
is in 1985 in April when he was in Saudi Arabia with David Fasold. They were under house arrest. Now, uh, I think Mr. Fasold had more freedom than Ron did due to Ron having been in prison before, so Ron was confined to one room and all he had was a TV to watch. And he was just sitting there watching TV until he was called, I think it was later that day or early the next morning, when he had to appear in front of a group of investigators and many imams who were there. They were going to question him. And, you know, the questions were, why would, would you know, Allah do this and do that? And Ron said something came to his mind. He, he remembered that he had seen something on TV either that morning or, or the day before. And on this program, there was an imam on there who, who said, uh, there is no greater um, sin than hiding something that a prophet has said to give credit to the prophet. Now, I will, I, I can't quote this, but I can find it and put it on the screen exactly what it says. And when Ron said that, he looked at these imams and he says, was not Musa a prophet of Allah? And he said they were all bending over each other going, oh, yes, 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 yes. And at that point, everyone just stared at him because the interpreters had not interpreted his words. They had heard what he said in their language. And Ron said he was puzzled and confused because he did not speak Arabic. And later, when he talked to someone, and I don't know who at this moment, um, he said, is it possible I could have heard this in English on the television? And they said, no. It is a, a punish, punishable by death to read the Quran in English. So what happened at that event was God let Ron hear something that was needful for him at that time. And he heard it before the event took place in his own language, and when he spoke his reply, those people who spoke Arabic understood what he was saying. And Ron said for the first time, he understood what speaking in tongues must be like. He said, I must have been speaking in tongues and hearing in tongues, <laughs> but he said, I wasn't aware of it, but the results were incredible. So yes, God, and has worked many miracles for Ron through the years. Well, let me ask you, why are you into this, Ron? <laughs> okay, thank you, <laughs> Jean. Uh, during the last centuries of the Christian era, uh, most people, if they didn't get run over by a truck or something, had a lifetime to develop a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's my feeling from studying the Bible that we are uh, in a rehabilitation program. And if we cooperate with God, He will work on our characters and make us fit to live in a sinless universe. All right. So I do believe now that we're living in the last generation, and I don't have time to go into the reasons why, but mm -hmm. many other people agree with this idea. And so I feel that now everybody, all ages, are going to have to learn uh, to walk with God now they don't have a lifetime and we have a lot of people honest people that don't go to churches we have a lot of honest people in churches we have a lot of honest people even in saudi arabia mm -hmm. and these people over there are not allowed to hear any of this uh you know about uh the bible in our sense of the word so i believe that god has preserved little time capsules of information from Old Testament times, mm -hmm. and that these are in caves, they're under the sea, they are in the pyramids and different places, mm -hmm. and that at this time he's going to bring them out, and he wants a particular story told with these. If there's mm -hmm. anything I've been impressed about, it's that you cannot find any of these major items without you go to God and and 
allow him to help you get the story straight that he mm -hmm. wants told with them. And so anyway, this is the motivation behind this. See. And, and, and at this time he's going to reveal these pieces to uh, give us physical evidence. Right, yes. On top of everything else. Right. Uh, a lot of people say that doesn't demonstrate a lot of faith, but uh, if you're facing a machine gun or something like this and, uh, you know, and somebody uh, things are a little bit different. It takes a little different faith there than it does to mm -hmm. get up in church and testify and tell Absolutely. how much faith yeah. you've got. Absolutely. And and I think that a lot of people will be very surprised when their faith is put to a test if they, you know, if they don't have the real faith. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that God in his care for his children here has designed this so that we can hear with our ears, we can see with our eyes, and we can feel with our hands, mm -hmm. and uh, that we can really uh, have faith and confidence uh, in him and the plans he has for us. Mm -hmm.